Hello, everybody. Welcome. Happy Friday. I want to welcome you back to the Stony Brook Sports Medicine Update webinar series. Today, we are going to be talking about the hip. Just a reminder to everybody, please make sure that your microphones are off and your webcam is also off so that we can give the presenters the best opportunity to give a good presentation today. Our course description, the Stony Brook Department of Orthopedics invites you to attend the next webinar segment comprising the 10th annual Stony Brook Sports Medicine Update, Women in Sports Medicine. This mini course is designed to cover the most current evidence-based practice related to orthopedic issues in sports medicine today. The focus of this course is on the hip. The target audience consists of physicians, athletic trainers, physical therapists, physician assistants, students, and all of those involved with the care of athletes. Important reminder, uh, I just announced, make sure that you have your full name and title to ensure you get the educational credit for attending this webinar today. The meeting is being recorded for future use with educational programs, so please keep that in mind. If you have any questions throughout, you may uh, message them to me personally in the chat box or to everybody. There'll be a, a time at the end that we can answer them for you. Our objectives here today are to understand normal and pathologic anatomy of the hip, identify key examination factors in determining the origin of hip pain and use of further imaging, and explore the surgical intervention options for treatment of hip injuries. Our presenters today are Dr. Nizemi. He is a PGY3 orthopedic surgery resident presenting on the anatomy of the hip with a dissection presentation. Dr. Patterson will be discussing hip pain exam and imaging. And Dr. Wallach will be discussing hip arthroscopy indications and techniques. Few formalities before we get started are accreditation. The School of Medicine, State University of New York at Stony Brook is accredited by the Accreditation Council for Continuing Medical Education to provide continuing medical education for physicians. The School of Medicine, State University of New York at Stony Brook designates this live activity for a maximum of 2.0 AMA PRA Category 1 credit. Physicians should only claim the credit commensurate with the extent of their participation in the activity. If you have any questions in regards to your continuing education credit, please contact the CME office at 444-2094 uh, to speak with Donna or Myra. For physical therapists and athletic trainers, the continuing uh, medica med medical education, excuse me, office is not responsible for awarding CEU, CEU, or contact hours. You may obtain a letter of participation for those hours and submit it to your accrediting agency. We have two very important people below. Patricia Lamb is responsible for the phys uh, physical therapist certificates and Christos Gaglius is responsible for athletic trainers. This symposium qualifies for two contact hours as recognized by New York State Department of, uh, Board of Physical Therapy. For proof of attendance, you can email Patricia Lamb at the completion of this course. And the School of Health Technology and Management, Stony Brook University is approved by the Board of Certification to provide continuing education to athletic trainers. This program is eligible for a maximum of two category A CEUs. ATs should only claim those hours actually spent in the educational program. For athletic trainers, you have to send that second form or the, the or form uh, for uh, the BOC board. Our disclosures in compliance with the ACCME standards for commercial support, everyone who is in a position to control the content of an educational activity provided by the School of Medicine is expected to disclose to the audience any relevant financial relationships with any commercial interest that relates to the content of his or her presentation. Dr. Nizemi, Dr. Patterson, Dr. Wallach, the faculty planners and reviewers, and the CME provider have no relevant financial relationship with the commercial we want to remind you that the emergency room is not your only option. Stony Brook Orthopedics does have an orthopedic urgent care with walk-in hours located at our East Atawket office, Monday through Friday from 3 to 6.30 p.m. We take care of same-day strains, 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 minor fractures, dislocations, and all sports-related injuries without an appointment. If you have any questions, please call our main scheduling line at 444-4233. That being said, I want to just remind you, if you have any questions, feel free to chat, uh, put them in the chat box. Uh, we will have a dedicated time after the presentations to answer those questions. With that being said, I want to offer the screen sharing capability to Dr. Nazemi, who will start us off with the anatomy of the hip presentation with the dissection video. It's all yours, Dr. Nazemi. All right. Thank you, Dana. Let me share the presentation here. Because if you go faster, then the machine will pick it up. Um, um, yeah. <laughs> 
And if you can have uh, the audience please try to mute their microphones and we'll get started. All right. So for those of you who don't know me, I'm Ali Reza Nazemi. I'm a third year orthopedic surgery resident at Stony Brook, and I'll be presenting Anatomy of the Hip, a dissection presentation. So starting off with a video. This is Tua Tagovailoa, Alabama's quarterback in 2019. He suffered a posterior hip dislocation and a posterior wall of the acetabulum fracture. So obviously this is a very extreme injury in orthopedics, but um, it's important to understand the anatomy so that we can apply it in treating athletes. The hip itself is a ball and socket joint. Um, it involves the femur, which is the thigh bone, the longest bone in the body, going into the femoral head. And it articulates with the socket, which is the acetabulum, which is part of the pelvis. Inside of that joint is articular cartilage and the labrum. And on the outside of the joint is a synovial joint capsule. Now, in order to understand the hip joint, you also want to understand the bony anatomy because that's where a lot of the muscles that move the hip attach. So looking at the hip from the front, you have the greater trochanter, the intertrochanteric line, and the lesser trochanter, and this is the femoral neck and head. And looking at the femur from the back, you have the greater trochanter, the trochanteric crest, and the lesser trochanter, and then the pectineal line, the gluteal tuberosity, and the linea aspera. And these are all important muscle attachment sites. Now on the socket side, that's part of the pelvis. So the socket is called the acetabulum, and the pelvis is formed by these three bones, the ilium, which is the wing here, the ischium, and the pubis, which meets at the pubic symphysis. In the back, you have the sacrum, which is part of the spine. Um, these three bones of the pelvis looked at from the side, there's a cartilage between them called the triradiate cartilage. And in children, as they mature, this cartilage fuses to form one continuous bony unit. But if you actually look at the child's x-ray, these will look like separate bones because there's cartilage in between. Them. In terms of the bony anatomy of the hip, there's actual bony prominences that you can palpate or feel when you're examining a patient. If you start with the side of the pelvis at the top, you have the iliac crest, which you can actually feel across here. And in the front of that is the anterior superior iliac spine, or ASIS. And the back of that, you have the posterior superior iliac spine, or PSIS. And another important thing to be able to feel is the greater trochanter, which is over here. And you can feel that lower down on the lateral side of the hip. And these important attachment sites actually can be involved in injury. So an avulsion fracture is when strong tendon pulls a bony attachment off at where the muscle attaches to the bone. And it's due to an eccentric contraction while the physis is weak. So in children that are growing, the tendon is actually stronger than the bone and it can pull this bony fragment off. But these injuries can occur at any age. Um, and a couple of common ones to know are the anterior superior iliac spine or ASIS avulsion due to the sartorius muscle, the AIIS avulsion from the rectus femoris, and the ischial tuberosity avulsion from the hamstrings. Looking at the acetabulum, uh, it can be divided into quadrants, and the way to do that is to take one line from the ASIS through the center of the acetabulum, and then take another line perpendicular to the first line through the center of the acetabulum. And when you do that, you get four quadrants. And that's important because if you're doing a hip replacement or fixing a fracture of the acetabulum or hip socket, you might need to put screws in. And you want to put those screws in a safe area, which is known as the posterior superior quadrant. So you can line up the screw holes and put them in this bone here. In terms of the joint capsule on the outside, it's composed of three ligaments, two in the front and one in the back. In the front, you have the iliofemoral ligament and the pubofemoral ligament. And in the back, you have the ischiofemoral ligament, which is known as the Y ligament, which is one of the strongest ligaments in the body. And these ligaments actually move with the hip and they're tight in extension and looser in flexion. In terms of the way the hip moves, it moves in three axes, flexion and extension shown here. 
abduction and adduction shown here, as well as external and internal rotation. And these movements can actually be combined when examining the hip in order to try to elicit different pathologies. Two common positions are known as Faber and Fadir. So Faber is flexion, abduction, external rotation. And Fadir is flexion, adduction, and internal rotation shown here. In order to understand the way the hip moves, you need to understand the muscles, especially in the thigh. And the thigh is made up of three compartments of muscles. The anterior compartment, which is mostly innervated by the femoral nerve, which contains the sartorius and the quadriceps muscles. You have the medial compartment, which is mostly innervated by the obturator nerve, and it includes the pectineus, the obturator externus, gracilis, and adductor muscles and the posterior compartment, which is mainly innervated by the sciatic nerve, and it contains the hamstrings muscles, the biceps femoris, the semitendinosus, and semimembranosus. The quadriceps is the strongest muscle unit in the body. Uh, it's in the anterior compartment of the thigh, and it contains the rectus femoris, the vastus medialis, which is under the rectus femoris, the vastus intermedius, and vastus lateralis. Um, these all insert through the patella or kneecap into the tibial tuberosity on the shin bone. And this is also important to understand because it can be involved in an injury called a quadriceps contusion, where patients have bruising on the anterior thigh, they can have point tenderness, um, and this is because there's actual microhemorrhage of blood into that muscle due to an injury. Um, if a patient's not able to do any extension of their leg at all, that would be an indication to do an MRI, and that's to evaluate the extensor mechanism. And on an MRI, these are axial cuts or slices through the thigh, especially on this T2 image where fluid is bright, you can see all this fluid collected in the, the actual quadriceps muscle. Um, these are treated with immobilization, with knee flexion, ice, and an ACE wrap, but an important thing to note is to be concerned for compartment syndrome. So if someone has a tense, swollen compartment, particularly if they're having some numbness or tingling, especially if they have a lot of pain, you want to get them evaluated in the emergency room right away in order to evaluate for this because this can be a devastating injury. Deep muscle anatomy uh, can also be understood by the insertion. There's a lot of muscles that move the hip, but if you look at where these muscles attach, you can understand them in groups. Uh, so in the greater trogonal, you have the vastus lateralis, gluteus medius, gluteus minimus, the superior and inferior gemelli, uh, piriformis and optator internus, and the lesser trochanter, you have uh, psoas major and iliacus coming together to form a conjoined tendon that attaches there. Another thing that's important about these muscles uh, that have the star by them is they're grouped together to be called the short external rotators. These muscles are important when you're doing a posterior approach to a hip replacement because you actually have to divide them and the sciatic nerve runs right under the piriformis so you have to be careful with that approach. Another way to look at the muscle anatomy is the way they function and there's different groups of muscles by their function. So the hip flexors include the iliopsoas, the rectus femoris, sartorius, tensor fasciolata, and pectineus. The hip extensors include the gluteus maximus and the hamstrings muscle group. The hip adductors, which bring the hip in, are the adductor longus, brevis, posterior portion of the magnus, and the gracilis. And the hip abductors are the gluteus medius, minimus, and tensor fasciolata. And then you have the short external rotators as well from the previous slide. In terms of the neurovascular anatomy, without getting too detailed, just note that the common iliac branches into the external iliac in the pelvis, and below the inguinal ligament, you have the external iliac artery turning into the femoral artery, which is the main blood supply to the lower extremity. And another thing to note is that the medial circumflex femoral artery is the main blood supply to the femoral head, and it goes inside this hip capsule. So if someone has a fracture and it's up here, anywhere from here in the capsule up all the way through here, it can disrupt this blood supply. And it makes it more likely that you'll actually need to do a partial replacement, which is replacing the femur or even a total replacement if there's pathology on the socket side. 
versus a fracture that's lower down, down here might be able to be repaired with a nail down the femur. In terms of the nervous anatomy on the surface, what supplies your skin, the lateral femoral cutaneous nerve is anterolateral thigh, and that can be compressed in a condition called neuralgia parasitica due to a tight waistband or from trauma or even from surgery, and that causes some anterior thigh pain and numbness. In terms of a hip replacement, there are different approaches, and without getting too detailed, just know that they can be either between an internervous plane, which is between two muscles that are innervated by different nerves, or an intramuscular or intermuscular plane, where you go either within the same muscle or between two muscles that are innervated by the same nerve. And you have a posterior approach, a lateral, and an anterior. And we'll get into the anterior approach with our video later. So inside the hip joint itself, you have a labrum. It deepens the hip joint. It's a similar concept to the shoulder where you have the glenoid labrum. Um, and you also have an acetabular ligament, the transverse acetabular ligament. And that also deepens the acetabulum and can allow some nutrient to enter the joint. On the femoral head connecting is the ligamentum teres. Uh, it inserts on the fovea capitis femoris. It's double banded with an ischial and a pubical fascicle. And um, it also has blood supply from the uh, anterior branch of the posterior division of the obturator artery. And some say that this structure is vestigial. There's some studies that also show that it's associated, uh, a tear in the ligamentum teres is associated with cartilage and uh, labral damage. And they're thought that that sort of is an indicative of some osteonecrosis that might occur as well. Uh, also could provide some blood supply and infancy, uh, proprioception, and uh, distribute synovial fluid to the hip joint. Now, when you're looking at someone with hip joint, the differential can be pretty broad. And the best way to do it is to localize exactly where it is. So have the patient point with one finger where their pain is most. And you can see if it's anterior, lateral, or posterior. And we'll go over some of the common causes. And even when you do get that spot, there still could be a lot of things going on, but we'll go over a few more common things. So when you have anterior hip pain and the patient says it hurts right in their groin, that can be oftentimes from the joint itself. So an older patient, the most common thing would be arthritis shown here. Um, younger patients can have pain from labral tears or femoral acetabular impingement or FAI. And we'll go over those. Posterior hip pain can be even from the back, can be sacroiliac joint dysfunction, lumbar radiculopathy, or piriformis muscle syndrome. And then lateral joint pain can even be from the greater trochanteric bursa or a condition called snapping hip, which we will go over. And important to understand, and we'll go over in much more detail later, is the labrum and articular cartilage, because there's a continuous area of that with a transition zone, and that is inside of the acetabulum or hip socket. So when you're doing a surgery with an arthroscope and looking in there with a the camera, you can actually uh, repair these structures and attend to them in surgery, tre surgical treatment. So one condition called snapping hip syndrome, uh, it can be three different types. External snapping hip is from the iliotibial band sliding over the greater trochanter, and this can actually be seen sometimes on exam in smaller patients. Internal snapping hip is that iliopsoas tendon that inserts on the lesser trochanter, sliding over different structures such as the femoral head. And intraarticular snapping hip can be due to loose bodies in the hip, or labral tears. This is an x-ray that shows a condition called synovial chondromatosis, which is more rare. So what is a labral tear? Uh, it's a tear in that horseshoe-shaped structure inside of the hip joint. Most common area for it is anterosuperior. Um, these are patients that have pain, locking, clicking, catching with moving of their hip. Um, in order to diagnose it, an MR arthrogram can show you that tear and it's 92% sensitive. And a good diagnostic maneuver that can be done in the office is uh, movement of the hip in two different positions. You can do a favor position, so flexion, abduction, external rotation to the opposite position. So getting them from that 
position into extension, adduction, and internal rotation, and that's more indicative of an anterior tear if they have pain, versus a fadir position, flexion, adduction, and internal rotation, getting that into extension, abduction, and external rotation can be more indicative of a posterior labral tear. Femoral acetabular impingement, or FAI, is a bony issue. So this is the normal femoral head and the acetabulum here. And there's two types and a combination of those two types. So you have pincer, which is acetabular deformity, where the lip is overgrown and gets caught. And another type would be cam, which is a femoral deformity, where the femoral head-neck junction has bony overgrowth. And then you can actually have a combination of these two where both the femoral and acetabular sides have deformities. And this can cause pain and limited internal rotation and flexion of the hip. And patients can have a lot of issues, especially at a young age. And it can actually damage the soft tissues as well. So pincer deformities sometimes have tears within the labrum and cam deformities can have separations of the labrum from the cartilage. In terms of greater trochanteric bursitis, so again, this is lateral sided hip pain. There's a trochanteric bursa, which is a fluid filled sac that sits above the greater trochanter, and it can become inflamed. And they have a gluteus medius tendon and a tensor fasciolata that run over this. So these muscles rub over this inflamed structure and aggravate it. And the treatment for this is to give NSAIDs and stretch, um, physical therapy. If a patient has continued pain, you can actually do a corticosteroid injection. So this is a T2 MRI. Again, the fluid is bright, and you can see that this inflamed greater trochanteric versa here uh, could potentially get injected with a steroid to reduce the inflammation. And uh, refractory cases, you can actually surgically remove the bursa rarely. Another thing to consider is piriformis muscle syndrome, and this is leg pain due to compression of the sciatic nerve. Uh, the sciatic nerve is between the short external rotators, um, and this can actually be correlated with femoral acetabular impingement. Uh, basically, if a patient has this, you can see here the piriformis muscle and how the sciatic nerve is closely um, situated next to that, and then you have the rest of the short external rotators right here. So if a patient has either anomalous anatomy of the sciatic nerve or the piriformis muscle or just compression due to hypertrophy of this muscle, um, they may have these symptoms uh, in their lower leg. And a position that can aggravate this is the fadir position. And again, flexion, adduction, and internal rotation. It can be treated with physical therapy and NSAIDs, and it can consider a steroid injection if those are still not helping the patient. So I know that was a lot, um, but we're going to transition from here onto a video that will hopefully make things more clear in terms of the anatomy. So I'll be going over a dissection presentation. This is the dissection portion of the hip anatomy presentation. This is the right hip with the anterior superior iliac spine circled. You can see the anterior compartment musculature with the skin dissected off, starting with the ASIS in the upper left-hand corner of the screen, going down the inguinal ligament, also from the ASIS going into the pelvis, as well as posteriorly towards the iliac crest of the pelvic bone. You can see that the inguinal ligament is a uh, ligament that protects the femoral neurovascular bundle as the external iliac artery turns into the femoral artery and the femoral vein turns back into the external iliac vein crossing underneath this ligament. Medial to that, in the medial border of the femoral triangle is the adductor longus and the gracilis, the remainder of the adductor musculature. Going back towards the lateral aspect we have the tensor fasciolata and the lateral femoral cutaneous nerve. This is an important nerve because it is located rather superficially, just medial and inferior to the ASIS, crosses under the inguinal ligament, 
and it is a nerve that supplies sensation to the anterior thigh and injury to this nerve from a tight waistband can cause neuralgia parasitica, which is numbness and some pain in the anterior thigh proximal area. This nerve is also important when we're doing the anterior approach to the hip. This is in what's called an internervous plane between the sartorius, which is innervated by the femoral nerve, and the tensor fascia lata, which is innervated by the superior gluteal nerve. Starting at the ASIS, you see the iliac crest, which is the origin of the tensor fascia lata, and then the sartorius, which originates from the ASIS. The sartorius is innervated by the femoral nerve, and the tensor fascia lata is innervated by the superior gluteal nerve. Note the position of the lateral femoral cutaneous nerve, which is normally one centimeter medial to the ASIS and can run anterior through or posterior to the sartorius muscle origin. In addition, we have the rectus femoris, which is deep in this exposure, and it is one of the main components of the quadriceps musculature, and it is also innervated by the femoral nerve. Now, if you look at this from a more lateral view, you can see that we are beginning to view the hip joint with the acetabulum and just inside of that, the femoral head. And this is an exposure that provides access to the hip joint when we're doing a hip replacement. Here you can see on the left side of the screen, the origin of the tensor fascia lata being peeled off of the iliac crest and on the right side of the screen, you can see the adductor longus being released from its origin just lateral to the pubic symphysis. Now viewing the hip laterally, the tensor fascia lata peeled back, you can see the lateral femoral cutaneous nerve. Elevating that in deep, you can see the location of the superior gluteal nerve, which is located within the body of the gluteus medius now we will review an anterior hip replacement. You can see that this approach is in the interval with the tensor fascia lata and the sartorius. This is an internervous plane. We are demonstrating retractor placement here for exposure of the hip joint. Superiorly, we are retracting the sartorius upwards and inferiorly, we are retracting part of the tensor fascia lata and the gluteus medius in order to provide adequate exposure. You can see the hip joint capsule, which will need to be opened up in order to provide access to the hip joint itself. This animation shows the retractor placement around the femoral neck, as well as the hip joint capsule on the left being incised with a scalpel. Once this incision is made, we are able to directly access the hip joint itself. Note the femoral head and the femoral neck. A retractor is then placed just above the acetabular lip so that you can take some of the cartilage out as well. This cartilage will not be needed because the entire joint will be replaced. Now you can see a neck cut which is being made by a saw in order to remove the femoral head and neck, which will later be replaced with the femoral component of the hip replacement. This is then taken with a chisel and a mallet and removed. You can also see this being demonstrated on the cadaver hip, where we do a femoral cut from the anterior exposure using a saw and this saw is used to make a neck cut in order to remove the femoral head and neck portions. Now that the femoral head and neck have been removed, we have exposure to the acetabulum and the labrum is also taken out along with the ligamentum teres. This is what's called a reamer, which takes bone out of the acetabulum in order to make room for the cup, which is then implanted. A polyethylene liner is then placed within that cup. Now we've replaced the acetabulum or hip socket, so we move on to the femoral side of the replacement. We note that there is a neck cut and we are able to place a femoral stem along with a femoral head component into the canal of the femur 
which will then act as our new femoral head and neck. Usually before doing a surgery like this, x-rays are evaluated and templates are used to determine the appropriate size of these components. In addition, during the surgery, different sizes are trialed before putting in the final implants. Once the final implants are in, we reduce the hip joint and we test its range of motion and its stability. From a more sports medicine perspective, moving on to anatomy of the labrum itself, looking deeper within the proximal thigh musculature, here we see the iliopsoas tendon, which has been split and being retracted with suture. And you can see the femoral joint capsule, which is being pointed out. The joint capsule is now being incised in order to provide exposure to the joint. Retractors are then placed in order to provide better exposure so that we may properly assess the femoral head and neck. Seen here is the femoral head, the femoral neck, the greater trochanter, the inner trochanteric line going down towards the lesser trochanter, which is located slightly posterior. Now we are peeling back additional portions of the hip capsule in order to demonstrate some labral pathology. Now we are deeper anteriorly and we've retracted the iliopsoas tendon, which as you note, goes right over the hip and can actually be the culprit in internal snapping hip syndrome. The femoral head is attached to the acetabulum via the ligamentum teres, which is seen inside of the hip joint at the apex of the femoral head. Dislocating the hip joint provides a better exposure of the ligamentum teres. Now you can see the way that the femoral head moves within the socket with hip flexion, adduction, and internal rotation or the fadir position. Now we're going to create a tear in the labrum and demonstrate how a labral tear interacts with the femoral head with different motions of the hip joint. Now that the labral tear has been made, you can see that starting with flexion, adduction, and internal rotation, going into extension, abduction, and external rotation, that labral tear displaces, which would cause pain, clicking, and catching. In this demonstration, we've recreated some tension with sutures in order to better demonstrate the way that the labral tear is displaced with different hip tests. With the Fabir test, flexion, abduction, internal rotation, you can see that with tension placed on the labrum that the labral tear actually does move and displace with this motion. You can see the widening of the labral tear here and this is what causes that painful locking, clicking and catching which is better demonstrated with this anatomic test. Here is an opening and you can see that there's quite a bit of gapping here and this is something that may even need to be treated surgically if it causes significant pain. Now we're going to demonstrate an open labral repair. This is a very wide exposure for illustrative purposes only. Normally this would be done arthroscopically with a hip arthroscopy. You can see the labral tear here. We are repairing the labral tear using a luggage tag suture technique, which is demonstrated here. Once we loop this through, we pull it through the loop and it forms a structure similar to a luggage tag you would have on a suitcase. And that tightens the portion of the labrum that's torn. Now we're going towards a more distal portion of the tear. We again use the luggage tag technique to secure this portion of the tear on the labrum. When doing this arthroscopically, these knots can be tied using the arthroscope on the inside of the hip joint in order to secure the labrum. Now we have two luggage tags around portions of the labral tear, and we can see that they're tightened firmly around this torn aspect of the labrum. The next thing we want to do is to secure this torn edge of the labrum in order to tighten the tear and to restore the labrum back as close to its anatomic position as possible. In order to do this, we are using suture anchors, 
in order to put those anchors into the labrum, we actually have to drill holes into the acetabulum. This drill will be used in order to demonstrate drilling of the holes into the acetabulum. You can see this drill bit is quite wobbly. We would not recommend this for an actual labral repair. But for demonstrated purposes, we are drilling two holes into the acetabulum in order to secure this labral tear. So there's one hole. And we take the soft tissue out of the way and drill the second hole. Once we've drilled these two holes, we're now able to anchor this labral tear back into the acetabulum. So we're attaching these sutures into the anchor, and then once we've done that, we're going to pull appropriate tension on the labrum in order to secure it at the right amount of tension and reapproximate this labral tear or put it back together. So now that we've loaded these anchors, we are going to insert them into the pre-drilled holes, again pulling appropriate tension on the suture. Once they're all the way down into the bone, we've now secured our label tear back to its anatomic position and we can remove the inserter and now we have screws which are attached to the suture which are attached to the labral tear which secure it all back down to where it originally was supposed to be and we can just cut these sutures and this labrum should be functional again and not cause the problems of the locking and the clicking and the catching that were bothering the patient before the surgery. Okay, so hopefully that was helpful. Um, I'm gonna now transition back to Dana and then we can take any questions at the end of the presentations. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Dr. Nozemi. And a big thank you to Dr. Penna with you also for doing the dissection. I know you guys took a lot of time out of your day to make sure that those videos were great for everybody here. So thank you again to you and to Dr. Penna. Uh, at this time, I want to open up uh, to Dr. Patterson. I have been getting quite a few emails from people who weren't able to sign on to this conference today, and that's okay because I know work schedules are a little bit crazy. We do record these videos, so if you know anybody who hasn't had the opportunity to sign on to these, they are available on the Stony Brook Medicine YouTube page. So uh, don't panic if you're stuck at work and working long hours. We will be able to offer these videos to use uh, just for your benefit for education purposes afterwards. Uh, so that, with that being said, I'd like to give Dr. Patterson the screen sharing to start her presentation on hip pain exam and imaging. Hi, thank you. Just just a second. Okay. Uh, hi to anyone I, I don't know. My name is uh, Dr. Diana Patterson. I'm uh, one of the sports medicine physicians in the Department of uh, Orthopedics. Um, and I'm going to be talking today about hip pain, um, some physical exam pearls and, and general things we look for and some, some basic imaging and things that we look for in that as well. So disclosures, I have no disclosures relevant to this presentation. Objectives of my part of the talk are to discuss related hip pathologies, um, some hopefully not too repetitive because Ali did such a great job, um, an overview of some physical exam of the hip and provide an overview and evaluation of some basic diagnostic imaging options. So athletic conditions of the hip range from acute injuries to hip more chronic conditions like a hip labral tear uh, based on also, you know, with or without some underlying uh, bony abnormalities, whether it's femoral acetabular impingement, uh, acetabular dysplasia, or, or early hip arthritis, also due to one of the others. Um, also, 
worth mentioning is femoral neck or other uh, pelvic stress fractures, as well as athletic pubalgia or osteitis pubis, all of which can be causes for groin pain and, and on a differential. So the acutely injured athletic hip, always want to think of or be concerned about a hip dislocation, um, more subtly a hip subluxation, uh, lateral impact hip injuries, which can have consequences down the road, uh, hip flexor or adductor strains, um, and then as well as pelvic avulsion fractures from uh, the muscle attachments around the pelvis. Um, and then of course, is to remember to think of the hip because um, particularly for those of you who work with uh, adolescents or younger adolescents or kids or with uh, youth sports or anything like that, um, children and adolescents that present with knee pain can have hip pathology. Uh, one of those that is most notorious is what's called slipped capital femoral epiphysis or SCIFI, uh, which is there in the, in the picture on the right. It's a disruption of the proximal femoral physis and due to its being, uh, or it, common presentation with just knee pain, um, a delay in diagnosis is extremely common and you know quite detrimental. So basics of Skiffy very quickly. Proximal femoral physial disruption, it's, it can be acute or chronic. The chronic ones in particular can be missed, particularly sort of like the patient on the, on the right, which was a 13-year-old female and had a year of hip pain and stiffness before it was diagnosed. Um, incidence is about two in 100,000. Ratio is three to one male to female. It is more common in African-American than in Caucasians. Um, a main risk factor is obesity. Um, most common in slightly younger uh, girls and slightly older boys based on adolescence and puberty and, and when the physis closes. And it can be up uh, bilateral and up to 40% of, of patients and not necessarily simultaneously bilateral, but happen uh, um, separated by months or even years. Again, similar video because it was a high profile event, but a hip dislocation uh, most commonly after a sports, I mean, sorry, after uh, motor vehicle accidents, but can happen in sports. Main risk for this is uh, long-term is avascular necrosis because of damage to the medial femoral circumflex artery. Um, reduce the, this risk is reduced with emergent reduction. Um, again, something to remember uh, for anyone working with uh, sports teams. Um, concern, things that can last after this also, as well as pelvic fractures, if it's a younger individual, um, osteochondral fractures or loose bodies, um, sharing of the cartilage with either the dislocation or the reduction uh, process. And if they're particularly young, a physial fracture, uh, similar to a skiffy um, from the trauma. Uh, another word again on avulsion fractures, I think the two most common would be the sartorius, which is off the ASIS. Uh, we see this frequently with, some, with sudden hip extension, such as taking off on a sprint or a batter, leaving the batter's box. Um, AIIS, um, just below that, um, on top of the hip joint would be the rectus, particularly with hip extension and knee flexion, such as kicking, either in soccer or a, a punter in football. Um, Ischial tuberosity, you can get hamstrings, and those can also have a, because there's a growth plate there, it can have a, a bony uh, piece with them as well in younger patients. Iliac crest, lesser trochanter can get psoas, avulsions, and then the pubic symphysis uh, adductors as well. So we're on femoral neck stress fractures. They can present with groin pain. They can be insidious and in onset, uh, pain with activity, uh, pain that worsens with weight bearing. Uh, if it's, if it can also just start with pain with activity um, as they increase in their run distance. People may report a recent increase in their amount of activity or increase in their mileage. More common in girls than in men. Uh, particularly because of risk factors, including the female athlete triad and particularly in adolescent teenagers, and then also a high rate of calcium or vitamin D deficiency. And some studies have uh, encouraged supplementing with vitamin D in patients who develop a stress fracture, even if labs demonstrate that they are currently sort of on the normal end of vitamin D. And the risk of fracture progression is definitely to be paid attention to. They're, they can occur on the tension side or the compression side of, of the femoral neck. The tension sides on the left is the tension side being the top part of the femoral neck. Um, and that is just based on the bone mechanics. At that point, with every step, the bone is, the fracture is being pulled on. And therefore it has a very high rate of propagating to a full femoral neck fracture, which is a disastrous thing that requires emergency surgery, particularly in a younger individual. On the compression side on the right, it's more on the bottom side of the femoral neck. So that's where, because based on the bone uh, mechanics, every step that anyone uh, takes, it sort of is compressing, and those can be treated non-operatively with protected weight bearing and 
crutches and time, unless of course, uh, by the time it's diagnosed, the fracture line can be seen to extend all the way or a large part of the way across the femoral neck. And those should also be referred for uh, emergent surgical evaluation. Athletic pubalgia or osteitis pubis. Um, athletic pubalgia is more colloquially known as a sports hernia. It's a disruption of the attachment of the abdominal muscles or the adductors or any uh, the fascia in the area. There's a, a couple different varieties uh, or versions uh, from the pubis or pubic symphysis. And it can present with groin pain with any activity that increases intra-abdominal pressure and such as a resisted sit up or coughing or sneezing even. This can be treated or attempt to be treated non-operatively, but frequently do require a surgical repair. Osteitis pubis is an inflammation or a dissolution um, of the pubic symphysis with the surrounding muscle insertions uh, at the bone. Um, people, patients can present with single leg stance, pain, anything with pain, uh, kicking or twisting. And these two can occur with other sports injuries to the hip. One of the theories is that uh, acetabular uh, FAI, which I'll get to in a sec, um, causes reduced range of motion of the hip, so therefore a greater amount of force or torque goes through the pubic symphysis and therefore results in more uh, central groin injuries. As Ali mentioned, hip labral tears. The labrum is a highly innervated structure that uh, increases the stability of the hip joint. It is a pain generator. Uh, tears of this labrum can contribute to uh, micro instability or frank instability of the hip. Um, Isolated tears used to be thought to be uh, potentially common after trauma or other events. However, now increasing research uh, attributes the vast majority of labral tears to a to one of several underlying bony abnormalities. This, these are on the spectrum from acetabular dysplasia to femoral acetabular impingement and in between, particularly as we distill down on our, our understanding of the different subtypes of femoral acetabular impingement. can prevent with groin pain, pain, as well as some ankle stems. Hip and pint, briefly, so normal hip range of motion relies on the congruence of the femoral tabulum to do flexion, extension, abduction, adduction, external and internal rotation. Femoral acetabular impingement is a type of altered anatomy, uh, for lack of in, in simplistic terms. The cam de fem, de Cam deformity is a femoral head asphericity or a, uh, in, a loss of offset at the usual head neck junction. And the pincer impingement is focal overgrowth or uh, based on different angulation, the acetabulum and femur, which is referred to as version. Symptoms and signs of this can be flexion, particularly flexion and internal rotation, joint pain uh, or hip pain, pain with prolonged sitting, and mechanical symptoms are also possible. Specifically, impingement in the x ray on the right in comparison. And then labral tears and chondrolabral junction uh, erosion uh, occurs with inclusion of the cam it can lead to the reduced range because it quite literally is bony impingement when a patient tries to go into deep flexion or the cam lesion slowly wears away at the cartilage at the, at the edge of the acetabulum and studies have shown increased size of the cam deformity and associated with an increased likelihood of symptoms Uh, or global overcoverage of the femoral head. Increasingly, studies have shown that it could also be related to version or the direction that the acetabulum points or the relationship of the femoral neck and the acetabulum as we get uh, more and more detailed in our understanding of the mechanics of it. Um, the labral injury that can result from this is more of a crush injury because it is on the edge of the acetabulum that gets pinched quite literally between the femoral neck of the area of over coverage. They can also cause some chondro chondral lesions or bruising um, on the posterior aspect of the acetabulum and what's called the counter or con contra coup lesion. Etiology of FAI is thought to be stressed to the proximal femoral physis or the growth plate, particularly at young of occurrence in athletes and certain sports have an even higher rate, particularly hockey, soccer, basketball, and some baseball 
studies have shown that uh, radiographic evidence of femoral acetabular impingement is seen amongst 94 football players undergoing imaging at the NHL combine and up to 70% of NHL players, a lot of which is asymptomatic. Um, it's also known now to be a major risk factor for the In a systematic review, looking at the association between sports participation and development of just, in particular, the CAM deformity of all of which who participated in elite level athletics during their skeletal immaturity, um, basketball, hockey, and soccer in particular, and patients in these studies were 1.9 to up to eight times more likely to develop a CAM deformity of skeletal maturity. Um, there was a 41% prevalence in the athlete versus 17% in the control patient. So then the consequences of femoral acetabular impingement, um, a retrospective study looking at uh, preoperative x-rays of a large group of individuals undergoing hip arthroplasty found a significant increase in radiographic signs of FAI in patients under 50 undergoing arthroplasty in comparison to older patients. And so it is known now that FAI leads to early osteoarthritis. And some feel that up to 70 to 90 percent of all hip arthritis cases are believed to result in either a dysplasia or an FA or result of, sorry, a dysplasia or a FAI, particularly those patients who end up with hip replacements less than at less than 50 years of age. And so the question, of course, is can surgery for FAI? Um, the, however, of course, not all patients with FAI develop symptomatic arthritis. So in a review of nine asymptomatic hips, um, found that nearly 20 years, almost over 80% of them didn't have any arthritis, and only 17% did, and that was at a mean of 12 years. Um, studies are ongoing, particularly basic science and other longitudinal studies to figure out what factors or elements of the mechanics of the FAI or the cartilage damage in particular genetics as well that could lead some people to be getting arthritis the exact same looking as. So in the absence of symptoms, currently prophylactic treatment is not warranted for FAI. In particular, another more recent study, which was of over 2,000 hips, looking at um, with a mean age of about 25, found the prevalence of an asymptomatic cam deformity was 37% and up to 55% in athletes uh, versus 23 in the general population. The prevalence of asymptomatic hips with a pincer deformity was up to 67%. And of the seven studies in this systematic review that reported on labrum, uh, tears, it, they were found in asymptomatically in 68% hips. So just a cross-section of the, um, you know, asymptomatic volunteer population done by a large group of uh, very prolific hip arthroscopy surgeons. On the other term is acetabular dysplasia, which is under coverage of the femoral head by the acetabulum or a shallow socket. It's, you know, well documented in uh, children and pediatric or mixed, particularly when it's very significant or caught at birth with hip pops and clicks um, in we are gaining an understanding of borderline dysplasia which is slightly less um, less severe of a, an undercoverage so what we is what's called the lateral center edge angle which I'll go into when I talk about some imaging and so a high percent of patients with lateral center edge angles under 20 do pro progress to osteoarthritis any specialty hip replacements, the malformation of the hip. Borderline dysplasia is less than normal, but it is uh, between 20 and 25. It's a, again, it's an ongoing area of significant research as to um, resulting pathology and what is the appropriate and you know best surgical treatment for those individuals. Acetabular dysplasia can lead to labral tears also. Um, this theory is due to the increased shear at the, acet at the acetabular labrum because it has to work harder to provide stability for the undercovered hip and therefore increased stress. And in many of the symptoms can start, they can be completely asymptomatic until they're in their late teens or 20s, even with, a, even with participating in high level athletics. And then they suffer a labral tear and then their symptoms start afterward as though they sort of slightly decompensated. They can present with the same symptoms of a labral tear, except in comparison to FAI patients, you'll frequently see an excess than, you know, greater than normal hip range of motion on exam. And a lot of these patients in, in comparison to football or basketball uh, or hockey have history of cheerleading or gymnastics or um, ballet in particular. Um, and um, they can also 
present in addition with groin pain from lateral pain, and it's thought by, by, men, by some to be due to fatigue of the hip stabilizers, all the muscles now, particularly after labral tears, having to work increasingly harder um, to stabilize the hip. And so moving on to clinical presentation and exam. So the main thing is around the hip is where is the pain? Similar to the shoulder where a lot of pathology can be referred from the neck and other areas, the hip we spent, uh, exam is important to figure out or try to elucidate exactly where the pain is coming from and could it be referred pain. Um, the tricky thing is that in particular, FAI commonly is colloquially known to present with a C sign where patients will grab the side of their hip and it's on the side, but it's also the front and the back, but not necessarily all the way in the time. But of course, these are showing that it might present in the groin per amount of the time and then the lateral hip the second most amount of time, but patients with this can also have some referred to a large range of other areas of their body, particularly even the knee, lower back, and various spots on the thigh. Clinical presentation, mentioned it a little bit before. Um, I always want to ask about activity related groin pain or lateral hip pain, um, feeling of stiffness, uh, pain with prolonged sitting, uh, mechanical symptoms if they have them, um, and then also to remember to assess medication history because history of steroids or childhood cancers or potentially alcohol abuse can also present that it's due to, it could be due to avascular necrosis, trauma history, whether they agree of a hip dislocation or car accidents um, that could have caused even to subluxation, uh, sports history, if they're older, did they play sports? You know, baseball was at a catcher versus an outfield football. And then of course, any history of hip pain or issues in the past, as far back as childhood, the x-ray on the you know, top right is a gentleman about 25 years old who walked into my office with some you know, activity related hip pain on the left side. But then for seeing the x-ray, he remembered, oh yeah, my parents told me that I had perthes and he had completely sort of forgotten because he was a young boy when it happened, didn't really know the details. Um, so on physical exam, we want to look at a patient's gait, their ability to stand, um, inspection, looking for you know uh, shoulder discrepancies or iliac crest height discrepancies, uh, leg length discrepancy. On gait, we want to look at um, Trollenberg, whether they can or not, and you can also assess uh, generally, you can assess some femoral version based on their foot progression angle on how they walk, whether it's internal of lateral hip and other bony prominences in areas that could be causing their pain, uh, range of motion assessment, and then special tests for impingement. And then, of course, examine the knee to make sure there couldn't be a contribution of lumbar spine or other radicular uh, radiculopathy. So Lundberg is from weakened abductors that lead to an altered stance or gait. So during stance, the weakened abductor allows the pelvis to tilt down on the opposite side. And then to compensate, the trunk lurches to the weakened side to attempt to maintain a level pelvis. When standing on the right leg, if the left, uh, because the contralateral side drops, the ipsilateral hip abductors aren't strong enough to stabilize the pelvis. Um, this can be someone who's um, radicular spine pathology, uh, herniated disc at a slightly higher pathology outside the hip. Assessment, you can start with seated internal and external rotation. Our normal values for these are about 20 to 35 or 30 to 45 degrees respectively. And then supine passive range of motion. Normal flexion is, uh, you know, these are general values, but about 120 degrees. Abduction normal with about 45, adduction about 20, um, and flexional rotation normal is about 10. Um, you can have excess of this, um, in particularly in dysplasia cases, and much reduced internal rotation in 90 degrees of flexion can be uh, very indicative of FAI. Um, and then flexion external rotation normal is about 40 degrees. A couple of special tests. First, there's the heel strike test or axial compression of the heel. Um, this can be concerning for a femoral neck stress fracture. If this is positive, uh, resistant straight leg raise also as the stinge field test. This can test psoas or assess 
you know, a clue for intra-articular pedagogy as the sort of pressures the labrum done where you saw the psoas running on, on the dissection video. The Thomas test in the top picture, it assesses for hip contracture if the patient's unable to keep their contralateral thigh on the table when they flex um, what their other knee. Uh, the Baton scale is useful for ligamentous laxity, particularly in someone who you're That's an assessment of whether they can uh, bend their small finger back right at the 90 degrees, their thumb all the way to their wrist, any hyperextension of about 10 degrees or more in their elbows or knees, or whether they can lean over and touch their palms to the floor without bending their knees. Any of those gets a score and we rate it out of nine. Um, and it is very useful for any sort of hip instability, micro instability. The type of their dysplasia assessment is for wrist couple impingement tests, uh, the flexion, deduction, internal rotation, or FADIR, also known as the anterior impingement test, lateral pain in the groin, or any sort of reduced internal rotation due to bony impingement. Um, the flexion abduction, or the Faber test, is also known as Patrick's test. Um, you abduct and externally rotate flex. Pain. It can be an intraarticular hip disorder or, or a psoas strain, but if it causes SI pain, historically it was initially, it was initially described for the SI joint. It could be of the lumbar or the eye joint, and then also for your hip pain, it uh, another area of hot research right now. Anterior instability or in the posterior impingement test, in the patient is and have their buttock from external room um, and a little bit of abduction, like in the diagram or in the picture, sorry, um, anterior versus posterior pain elucidate uh, what the origin of our symptoms is. And then internal and external snapping hip, like Ali mentioned, external snapping hip is the IT band over the greater trochanter and can sometimes even be visual or, or visualized uh, on the patient and internal snapping hip can be another source of mechanical symptoms felt in the groin, and it can be provoked by bringing the patient from maximal flexion and external rotation to extension and internal rotation, and it occurs when the psoas snaps over the pelvic brim. And then uh, continuing the exam to patient when they're lateral, um, palpate the trochanteric bursa, the insertion of the gluteus, the SI joint, lumbar paraspinal muscles. Um, you can assess for contracture of the Tensor fascia lata, the gluteus, medius, or maximus, that's in the over test or the modified over test. So, historically, the standard over test is for the TFL and it's leg in full extension into slight uh, knee in full extension, sorry, leg in slight extension dropped back behind. And if the, there's a contracture, the um, patient won't be able to bring their leg past neutral. If you bend the knee, it's more of a specific assessment for a gluteus medius contracture because it loosens the IT band. And if you use the knee in full extension and you uh, forward flex the hip to the front and then try and drop the knee down, it can be a contracture of the gluteus maximus. Also good here is to test abduction strength. And then particularly in uh, younger patients or in particularly in female patients, uh, a, a prone hip range of motion exam, uh, it can be a good screening test for increased femoral antiversion. So in general, just a good flow for the physical exam is we always try to make it efficient and repetitive each time is walking someone walk, and doing all of the tests with standing, a baton exam, and then have them sit and then move into supine range of motion testing and impingement testing, and then lateral and then prone. And it just, and then if you're doing the same thing every time with the same special tests, also, you know, based on what patients are telling you, can try to uh, provide this, you know, similar information each time and also make visits still efficient. It's one thing. And then moving on to some imaging. So despite the ready availability of MRI, plain radiography remains extremely valuable and useful um, for the hip, particularly in uh, femorosotabular impingement and dysplasia. Get a series of young hip uh, or images that many twins, many coined the sort of young hip series. So it's an AP pelvis, false profile view, uh, 45 degree done view and a frog leg lateral. And I'll go through each of those in specific. And then there's a series of angle measurements that we take for screening and other evaluation purposes that I'll show you. Um, MRI versus MRI arthrogram is still an ongoing debate. Um, and then CT scan 
these days is mostly um, thought by surgeons or reserved for preoperative planning purposes in those patients that are indicated for surgery. This is a basic AP pelvis x-ray. Um, we want to assess the quality of it so there's not too much rotation. So you can see the sacrum is, you know, in line with the pubic symphysis. Um, and then the this red arrow is pointing to what we call the sore seal, which is top of the acetabulum joint or the load-bearing portion of it that's uh, sclerotic. Um, it is used in a lot of our measurements. Of note, it doesn't necessarily go all the way out to the edge that you see based on the rotation and the shape of the acetabulum, but it is the overlying uh, roof of the acetabulum. This is what's called, that I mentioned earlier, this lateral center edge angle. Um, so it's a line from the center of the femoral head and directly from that, and then a line diagonal that affects the lateral edge of the seal, normal 35 degrees. Anything basic five, uh, significant is less than 20. The area of borderline dysplasia is between 20 and 25. And concerning for pincer, uh, pincer would be greater degrees. Next, we look at what's called the acetabular index. You might also see this in the literature referred to as the tonus angle, um, not the tonus index, which is something that is used for osteoarthritis, but more the tonus angle. Um, it's a measurement of the inclination of the uh, acetabulum, particularly with regards to under coverage. The floor of the acetabulum and then a line that Um, and normal is about zero to 10 degrees. Pincer is if it's less than that or less than zero, particularly because it comes over and intersects again. And dysplasia, because it would be up like this, is uh, usually greater than 10 degrees. And for comparison, um, you can see that lateral, lateral, how the lateral center edge angle shrinks and also how the acetabular inclination gets much larger. So these values are about five and, and 19. Um, so it's pretty significant dysplasia. Um, next, the last thing we sort of, we look at historically has been, or one other thing is called the crossover sign. And so it's a measurement of uh, version or direction of the acetabulum in particular. It looks at whether the anterior wall of the acetabulum and crosses over the posterior wall tracing of the acetabulum and at what point it does. And it can tell us, uh, clue us in as surgeons as to whether there could be some impingement due to acetabular shape and direction rather than just a cam deformity. Um, and then a lot, an interplay of other factors like that. There's a couple of the radiographic signs that we look for, but uh, those are the, some of the highest yield. Um, and oh, then this is more of a, an example of global overcoverage of pincer, as I've mentioned. It's called acetabular protrusio. So the, you, the acetabulum is very deep and the femoral head projects all the way through to the medial side. Um, Next view we look at is called the false profile view. It's when the pelvis is rotated about 65 degrees and you put the affected foot parallel to the x-ray film. And we're looking at this particular point uh, rather than the AP pelvis, which is the lateral coverage. Um, and so we look at similar to the lateral center edge angle, the anterior center edge angle, again, a line from the center of the femoral head straight up and the lateral edge of the sore seal. Um, normal again is 25 to 35, and so less than that would be some dysplasia, and greater than that would be concerning for some pincer. Um, with the symptomatic hip in 40 degrees of flexion and a little bit of abduction, um, which is one location where there can be x ray, as in the top line along the femoral neck line due to what we would call reduced offset. And we fit circle around the femoral head, and then we do neck and measure to the point at which the bump, as we would and that point is called 70, and an alpha angle or 45 is considered a concern for cam impingement. This is the last one. It's a frog lateral view. So it's a hip abducted about 45 degrees with the sole of the foot on the medial knee. So the knee is dropped all the way down. And this is more a view of directly anterior on the femoral neck. And again, we can measure alpha angle in the same way. Again, it's a greater than 40 to 40 degrees is concerning for uh, chem type FAI. MRI, of course, 
If you're ordering MRIs for concern, an MRI of the, of the symptomatic is better than an MRI of the pelvis because it's true of, of the symptomatic hip breath, uh, where there's not as much clarity uh, of the image. Uh, for visualizing labral tears, chondral delamination or lesions, uh, tears of the gluteus medius or trochanteric bursitis, which is sort of on the bottom right, um, avascular necrosis, uh, particularly early avascular necrosis, which is I've seen them in the femoral neck. I've had a, actually a teenage lesser trochanter. And then you can also see them if, in subtle findings in, in the sacrum and other areas as well. So that's why MRI is important. MRI is good, great. Uh, historically, MRI arthrogram was thought to be better than a standard MRI, but this is sort of changing with our improving machines, you know, greater prevalence of three Tesla machines uh, in the community rather than 1.5. Um, However, though, there is a rate of, you know, up to 30% of incidental labral pathology noted, um, sort of like some of the studies I mentioned earlier, there's a lot of asymptomatic pathology noted. And then also because, uh, you know, MRI without false negatives aren't uncommon. Less with MR arthrogram, which is when they, in, under fluoroscopic guidance, inject the contrast directly into the joint. It's not an MRI with contrast, but it's contrast in the joint. However, this is, of course, an increased risk because an increased cost because be quite painful for patients to do and also in the several days after and that um, includes concern that the arthrogram is not as good at seeing chondral lesions or arthritic the surgeons out there are choosing or sort of moving away from the arthrogram of course it's definitely still useful if you think you've gotten a false negative on an mri or someone continues to have pain other um reasons. Again, uh, lastly, sort of CT scan, many some surgical planning now, um, particularly to help avoid a radiation dose, uh, though they are trying to do it as low dose as possible. However, it is very useful for surgical planning, um, useful way to measure the femoral and acetabular version, um, because this is an area where uh, if a direction of the acetabulum it mismatches, it can be, you know, a different surgery could potentially be done. And also because the more research we do, we learn that uh, femoral acetabular impingement is not the same cam lesion in the same spot at the same time uh, or the same area every time, but it can be very patient specific. And these days with 3D, C 3D CT scans, uh, patients are quite literally getting uh, personalized imaging of their uh, cam deformity and their FAI and can be important for surgical planning. Also good for looking at any cystic changes of the femoral neck or the acetabulum, which could be a sign for some underlying arthritis. And then because of the radiation, many places are trying to replace this with 3D MRI, and there's some small studies, you know, ongoing studies trying to confirm that this is just as good at looking at the bone as, as 3D CT, but, um, and then, uh, but it is not quite yet established or quite as, as widespread. So that's any, and I'll turn it back to Dana to turn it over to Dr. Wallach. Awesome. Thank you so much, Dr. Patterson. At this time, I want to offer Dr. Wallach to have the screen sharing capabilities to start with his presentation on hip arthroscopy indica indications and techniques. Uh, thank you. I'm uh, Dr. Walken. I also would uh, like to thank uh, Diana and Ali for their excellent presentations. They made a lot of my work a whole lot, lot easier. In any event, I'm going to concentrate on hip arthroscopy um, as uh, the modality to treat uh, a myriad of uh, problems. I have uh, no disclosures. So when we talk about indications for the use of hip arthroscopy, uh, we're really talking about different um, locations. The central compartment is really the intraarticular portion where the femoral head and the acetabulum meet. Uh, the peripheral uh, compartment really is, is extra articular but intracapsular. We're talking about um, femoral neck and things that occur within that zone. Um, but uh, and then we're going to talk also about peritrochanteric area like rear trochanter, uh, which is the external snapping hip. And lastly, uh, uh, gluteal space. But I will primarily be talking about labral 
and chondral issues, um, uh, snapping, uh, and the types of impingement. This, of course, would be a, a loose body, um, which is uh, really um, removal of these kind of uh, lesions is really well uh, addressed with the arthroscopic uh, technique. So what are the, some of the contraindications, just to start off with about hip arthroscopy? It's really not for the patient with an advanced uh, osteoarthritis. Um, it's for, for smaller lesions, things that can be uh, addressed with either shaving or drilling. Um, but if you have global arthritis, uh, hip arthroscopy is not effective. Um, if you have a joint pain and your pain is attributed to active inflammatory arthritis, such as rheumatoid arthritis, hip arthroscopy is not going to be effective. If, however, uh, you are well controlled and have uh, a lesion such as a labral tear, um, there may be a place for you for the use of hip arthroscopy. Um, uh, obesity is an issue. Um, we use special instruments to do hip arthroscopy. And um, if the patient is too large, it may preclude the ability to actually get inside the joint. So that's a relative indication. And then lastly, uh, hip dysplasia, uh, which was just recently alluded to. Um, some mild forms of dysplasia can still be treated with uh, hip arthroscopy. However, um, if you have an advanced uh, dysplasia, uh, the treatments um, do not have uh, longevity uh, and other techniques, which I actually will discuss, um, should be used first. Uh, before I um, sign someone up for a hip scope, I, I need to think about what are the other sources of hip pain. Um, that last talk actually addressed a lot of these things very, very well. Um, you know, I want to think, uh, is it uh, intraarticular? Um, could it be the labrum? Could it be the cartilage? Could it be a function of instability or inflammation? Uh, is it extra uh, compartmental? Um, is it uh, impingement? But it also can be muscular. And it certainly can be spine or knee. So a, a crucial part of this is a, is a good clinical examination and looking at the imaging. Um, often I will then combine that with a confirmatory um, uh, injection. The injection is often, in fact, often it's always done under some form of image guidance, whether that is ultrasound or x-ray um, is a dealer's choice. But in any event, um, you will, uh, let's say for this example that we're using an injection in the hip, uh, first we'll you know, aspirate, uh, collect the fluid, make sure that I'm not looking at something such as an infection. Uh, I then will inject uh, a numbing medicine, long acting such as a Marcane, and then lastly, if uh, indicated for this patient, um, a uh, steroid. Um, so this injection is not just diagnostic, uh, but it is also therapeutic. So if there is a certain form of inflammatory component to their, uh, their pain, uh, this may give them significant relief and it will help me at least identify that yes, indeed, where I am uh, directing my attention uh, is the area that is a source of their pain. Uh, prior to an injection, um, I would uh, strongly recommend, in fact, I tell them to do this, uh, a pain diary. Um, so what I say to the patient is at time zero, um, write down where all your pain is. Is it, is it in the groin? Is it laterally, anteriorly, posteriorly? And how severe it is in those locations. Uh, on the day of injection, I encourage them actually to cause pain uh, because if you do an injection and have, someone has no pain, you haven't proven anything. Uh, so I actually want them to have significant pain at the time of the injection. And then 30 minutes or so afterwards, the, the Marcane should have done its job, and then they should re, re, um, put in their book, um, what is your discomfort is it in the different places? So do you feel better in the groin, but not on the lateral thigh? Where is the pain? How much is better? And this at least directs me to know uh, I'm in the right place. Interestingly enough, um, uh, the injection itself, although it can be helpful in identifying where I need to direct my attention, uh, it is not uh, predictive of how successful arthroscopy will be. So you may have identified that they truly have a large chondral lesion uh, and they actually felt better with the injection. Um, however, um, your treatment, which may involve um, arthroscopic debridement uh, and drilling, um, may not make them better. So it's actually not predictive of how successful the outcome will be. 
Uh, things that uh, uh, one should take in mind is the age of the patient, their degree of arthritis, and what type of surgery we are going to uh, be performing. Another thing to think about with hip arthroscopy, it's not the same as knee arthroscopy. Um, you know, we tout it as minimally invasive, and that is true in some sense. Uh, we do it through small portals, and for the most part, in fact, exclusively, it's an ambulatory procedure. However, um, to get into this very tight, constrained uh, space requires a fair amount of force. Uh, and uh, postoperatively, um, if you've had a patient who's had a knee scope and has had a hip scope, um, they will very much tell you they are not the same. We do need special instruments to do the procedure. Um, as opposed to a knee scope, um, the uh, actual lens is, is significantly larger. Um, and we use um, some blunt tip cannulas. Uh, these are the, uh, the tubes in which the scopes go in. Um, um, and it's better to use ones with a softer tip because the cartilage of the femoral um, head is much softer and is much easier to uh, injure uh, than one would have with, uh, with a knee. Uh, often we would need uh, these cannulas for working um, because there's a lot of soft tissue in the way uh, and as such we need to keep the soft tissue out uh, so that we can do our um, suture repairs if that's what is indicated. The scopes themselves actually um, uh, in a knee scope we use a 30 degree scope which gives us just a slight angle instead of directly at the surface we're working on but because the hip is far more constrained, um, a 70 degree arthroscope uh, is actually the working horse uh, lens that one would use uh, to treat with hip arthroscopy. The other very important thing that is very different from, a, from knee arthroscopy is the use of uh, C-arm. Um, unlike the knee, which is uh, easily palpable and you can direct your um, attention and your instruments without use of any imaging system. Um, with a hip, we actually need imaging uh, to locate uh, where we are in the joint, do it safely. Uh, and in fact, the, the systems themselves are uh, cannulated. In other words, we stick a needle in the joint uh, after appropriate distraction uh, and then place a guide wire followed by a dilating system, uh, followed by the placement of our scopes. Um, and whenever we remove our instruments, we leave um, uh, a rod behind so that we can find our way back in um, because access is certainly not as easy as it is with uh, a, knee, a knee arthroscopy. The other thing that's uh, very, very different is the need for distraction. Now we do need distraction when we do uh, ankle scopes, um, but when we do hip arthroscopy, we need a significantly more uh, distraction. And the traditional technique of doing that was using something called a uh, perineal post. In other words, we have uh, near their groin a, a large, very well padded uh, post uh, for which we pull uh, the hip uh, and distract it from the joint, uh, achieving uh, what we would like to see is 10 millimeters of uh, distraction. Uh, the instruments themselves really need about six millimeters so you can get in the joint, uh, and that's getting in the joint um, with six millimeters alone, you will probably scratch up the femoral head. So you need a lot of space uh, to prevent um, iatrogenic um, or surgeon-induced uh, trauma to the articular surface. Um, so there is an important nerve uh, that gets uh, pressed against uh, that post. Uh, if any of you have ever been on very long bike rides, uh, you may have experienced that numbness in your groin, um, and it can be certainly disconcerting. Well, we're going to do far more than just sit on a bicycle seat. You're actually going to pull quite hard, uh, and the nerve, as it passes through this space, um, uh, uh, the pudendal nerve, um, does not tolerate this well, and one can have numbness, uh, which can last a considerable amount of time and is very distressing. You know, you can uh, very successfully uh, repair their labrum, um, but when they go to the bathroom, they don't feel the things they need to feel, um, they're not going to be happy with it. So, um, the other things about the post, uh, it certainly does aid with distraction, but can also cause uh, necrosis uh, to the perineal tissue, so you can get uh, scrotal and labral necrosis, uh, you can get vaginal tears, um, so we need to put less um, pressure on uh, that space uh, 
Um, there are postless techniques, which I'm going to show in a second. But you can also actually tilt the table in a way that the patient's trendelenburg, head lower than feet, and with uh, gravity, uh, one can significantly reduce uh, the amount of pressure required uh, to distract the hip. The other thing you can use is what we call a high friction table, which means that um, the body doesn't slide, so you can pull and uh, gravity will help you with the distraction. Um, how much force is uh, used when you use a post? Um, well, 444 newtons in a woman and 517 newtons in a man on average. Uh, for those who are not uh, facile in the use of newtons, um, you know, lifting up a 100 gram apple is about a newton. So one can imagine 500 apples sitting on someone's groin uh, and um, you're certainly not surprised why they're numb um, at times. Uh, if you do a capsulotomy, it does lead to a 17% reduction in traction. Um, so with use of gravity, capsulotomy, and uh, with uh, postless tables, um, one can significantly decrease uh, the incidence of pudendal uh, nerve palsy. And this is one marketed brand of, uh, of table. And essentially what they're doing is the patient is in Trendelenburg, so their head is lower than their feet. Uh, and you are basically lifting them up by their legs. Uh, you do need to adjust your, your brain, the surgeon's brain, for, for working um, orientation because it's not flat. Um, but this is a, a newer and, uh, and an effective uh, technique. So when one enters the joint, uh, a couple of things. Um, you need uh, access, so we'll, we'll, we'll put the arm across the chest. Uh, you'll have 30 degrees of abduction of the non-operating leg, the neutral leg is out of the way, um, a little bit of flexion. Um, if you use the post, you should have it along the inner thigh and not directly uh, against the perineum or genital. Um, and the next thing one will do is vent the joint. In other words, uh, under x-ray guidance, you stick a needle, um, and under sterile conditions, you stick a needle into the joint, and allowing uh, air to enter um, will decrease um, the suction forces and less of a pull will be uh, required. Um, other things that are helpful is obviously is the post, but it has its downside as we talked about. Trenda Dellenberg we just talked about, which is being upside down. And then muscle relaxation is uh, greatly facilitates uh, distraction. So in the heavily muscled man, uh, you may have a hard time uh, getting into the joint. Oops, sorry. Uh, so under x-ray guidance, we, uh, we place our um, tools within. As I said, it's a, it's a cannulated uh, system, um, but we are very cognizant of multiple structures that are in the way, and Ali uh, did a beautiful job showing you some of them, uh, probably the most commonly injured is that of the lateral femoral nerve, uh, which is directly over the femoral head. Um, one of the portals, uh, which has uh, been traditionally used, which is the anterior portal, carries 38%, um, so for almost 40% of the time, it, it, the portal is directly over the nerve. Uh, so one just cuts skin and gently dissects, but it is relatively easy to injure the nerve. Uh, this nerve is responsible for skin sensation along the uh, lateral distal thigh, so just above the knee. Um, in this study, uh, which was a cadaveric study, um, the nerve lay was within um, 5.7 millimeters, plus or minus four and a half millimeters, which is not a lot uh, from the portal. Um, little safety is achieved if you move 15 millimeters more medial or five millimeters more, sorry, 15 millimeters more lateral or five millimeters more medial. Uh, although as you get more medial, you start to get to other neurovascular uh, structures. Okay. There are actually eight uh, classic um, portals that one uses, or typical portals that one uses uh, to do hip arthroscopy. Uh, in this example, the uh, ASIS is your anterior superior iliac spine. It's not a portal, but a palpable bony landmark, as is the greater trochanter, which is a palpable bony landmark. I should note that once you have vo uh, vented the um, the joint by sticking a needle in the joint, uh, you will start to have a shifting, so the separation between the ASAS and the greater trochanter because the bone, uh, the, the proximal femur will move distally. Uh, and so it is um, a good idea to do the first vent the joint and then establish 
uh, your portals. Um, the uh, most common uh, initial portal is that of the AL, which is anterolateral. Um, the uh, traditional anterior, um, anterior portal um, is the one we talked about having a significant risk of injury to the lateral femicutaneous nerve. Um, I have, as has been recommended, shifted to this uh, mid-anterior portal, which has a, a lower risk and actually has some better trajectory uh, for uh, arthroscopy. Uh, other very useful portals that are used include this, the DALA, which is the um, uh, distal anterolateral accessory portal. Uh, and this is very helpful getting the appropriate trajectory for uh, labral uh, work, um, placing our anchors and passing our suture. Um, when you start to talk about the PSP, uh, the PALA, these are ones that are very useful for when you're doing arthroscopy uh, for, say, the, the IT band, so you're doing an IT band resection. Um, so as I showed, central and extra, extra capsular, all right, I labeled in here in red. Um, these two are really more for the extra capsular um, trochanteric region, uh, and then the dollar can be actually used for all of them. Uh, the lateral femoral cutaneous nerve is not the only nerve that can be injured. Uh, the femoral nerve is certainly at risk from both stretch from traction, uh, as well as during some procedures, such as um, uh, when you um, uh, do uh, a um, iliopsoas lengthening uh, through the intracapsular region. Uh, with those portals, you actually get a uh, beautiful um, access to the joint itself, um, although one should uh, combine them with um, a capsulotomy, which is you cut the capsule um, uh, while looking inside the joint, and that will allow far more mobility. You get a tremendous view of the, uh, of the joint, uh, seeing uh, within the joint itself very well. You see the femoral head. You see the, the labrum in its totality. Um, you see the fovea and the ligamentum teres. Uh, and when one looks externally, uh, you can see uh, the femoral neck and the shadows of what is the iliopsoas and cam lesions. Uh, it's certainly a procedure that has its issues. Um, complications uh, are, uh, are certainly present and uh, possible. Uh, lateral femicutaneous nerve is um, uh, certainly is happening less using that uh, uh, MAP portal, but it can happen. Cudendal, we, we spent some time just talking about that. Uh, chondral injuries can happen just by placing your instruments so you need adequate distraction so you do not cause a scuff of the uh, femoral head. Uh, one can induce instability. Some patients actually have some micro instability to start with. Uh, and uh, when you kept the capsule on those patients, you certainly need to repair it uh, because then they may get the sensation of that their head, uh, femoral head is falling out of the joint. Femoral neck fracture is more of an issue after resection of um, uh, cam lesions. Avascular necrosis is a function of injury to the vessels traveling along the lateral femoral neck. Uh, when one does uh, traction, you place the feet in what looks like uh, ski boots. Um, they in themselves can cause kind of a crushing injury and, and uh, um, if the foot starts to slide out, you can get uh, skin issues. Uh, some of the instruments can uh, break if, if uh, care is not taken, particularly with the devices for uh, microfracture. Uh, increased abdominal compartment syndrome um, can happen, uh, particularly if this had been a patient who had some other conditions, such as they'd had a hip dislocation. Um, we talked about perineal injuries. Heterotopic ossification is the formation of bone uh, from the trauma of surgery itself, also uncommon, but can happen. And lastly, infection, which thankfully is not a common event. Um, the anatomy of the uh, labrum has already been discussed. Um, one can think of the labrum as the gasket of the hip, um, serving two functions. It maintains lubrication, and without synovial fluid, uh, one would quickly um, progress to uh, osteoarthritis. Uh, so it helps with the lubrication because cartilage in and of itself receives its nutrition from the synovial fluid. It also deepens the acetabulum um, and makes it more stable. Um, you can have tears that are from an acute event or can be from degenerative changes. Uh, so it can be traumatic, it can be from dysplasia, which is the abnormal growth of the uh, 
acetabulum femoral head, or it can be from impingement. The treatment for the uh, labrum is uh, debre debridement, repair, or replacement. Um, when I was a resident, it was all debridement, and then evolving over the last 20 years uh, has been that of repair, which has really shown itself to be a, a superior technique with better results. Uh, label replacement, which is done with uh, hamstring uh, allograft, uh, is a newer technique uh, with shorter follow, but certainly is promising. And that is in the case where the uh, labrum has been severely damaged, cannot be repaired, uh, but the remaining cartilage of the acetabulum is in relatively good repair. Uh, and this is an effort to preserve the hip uh, and prevent the uh, hip replacement doctors from uh, getting at that hip too early. The uh, techniques of repair uh, certainly are evolving. Um, the technique that you saw um, Dr. Nazimi showed was a variation of this technique um, where the sutures pass completely around the labrum. Uh, there is a drill hole placed in the um, bone and then it is anchored. Um, it is better to be actually in the line of where the uh, edge of the socket is, being careful that you do not penetrate and perforate into the acetabulum itself, but on the bony rim. So if the anchor is a little too high, it would actually start to pull the labrum out of the joint. And that's not what we want. We want to have a gas that so have to have a, a good uh, connection. If your uh, labrum is actually relatively thick, meaning it's more than five millimeters in size from here to here, uh, the actual superior technique, or at least the theoretical technique, is that of a vertical mattress, meaning basically passing the suture through the substance of the labrum and back and then anchoring it, and therefore not having suture, like here, against uh, cartilage, because that can abrade uh, and irritate. Also, one can see that when you pass the suture around the entire labrum, it does somewhat lift it up and away from the underlying cartilage. Where here and here, when you do pass it through the center of the labrum, we can keep continuity between the chondral surface of the acetabulum and the labrum. And this is, um, at least theoretically, a superior concept. So um, this is actually showing that kind of purse string, and this is the this was a kind of thin, and as such, it did not pass through it. But here you have examples of multiple. Um, uh, anchors place and bringing it down and in uh, to the, um, the socket. And here is uh, another of that sign. So repair is certainly superior to debridement. Um, still fairly good results with, with just debridement, um, but if one can uh, maintain uh, labrum, it then is the gasket. It, it keeps the fluid in, it does the stability, and certainly at early follow-up, and that's how most of the studies are really early follow-up, uh, results are better with a labral repair. Uh, Post-operatively really depends upon um, whether you did debridement or repair. Um, if you one did uh, debridement and mostly chondroplasty, meaning just shaving irregular cartilage on the acetabulum, uh, weight bearing can happen actually relatively uh, quickly and advance away from crutches after a short period of time. Um, because one did enter the joint and did cut the capsule, you know, hip extension and rotation is, um, is completely discouraged for at least a month and sometimes a little longer. When one does a repair, you have to protect the labrum against uh, issues of torsional stress and flexion. So one would keep the person from, from flexing more than uh, 90 degrees prevent the internal rotation and adduction, as well as actually external rotation, as you saw early in Dr. Nazini's uh, talk. Uh, really no active flexion for the first six weeks, and then progressively uh, increase that strengthening, still squatting after six weeks, only 45%, so we don't uh, impinge on the uh, labrum. And then depending upon what sport they're doing and how, if they are pain-free, you can consider return to sport at three months, um, although some may take longer. Chondral lesions are uh, injuries uh, to the cartilage. Um, they can be traumatic or they can be secondary to abnormal mechanical forces, such as uh, femoral acetabular impingement, which are the cam and pincer type lesions, as well as um, uh, hip dysplasia. Uh, 
um, the uh, condyles can happen on the femoral side or the acetabular side. Uh, if one had a hip dislocation, uh, you can knock off large pieces of the femoral head um, against the acetabular socket. Uh, they come in multiple grading system. Um, uh, grade one is just really softening. Two is just some splits. Three is there's actually a hole, but it's relatively small. And when you get to four, you're talking about uh, large lesions uh, greater than a centimeter and a half in size. Uh, treatment consists of debriding loose edges, um, microfracture, which is the idea of drilling it uh, and causing um, cells to come in and metaplase into a fibrous cartilage. So it's not the hyaline we like, but fibrous. And then there is cartilage transplant. Although I should say that the cartilage transplant has not really arthroscopically um, gotten to where it needs to be to be done completely through the scope. Um, sometimes that requires a second procedure um, with a uh, surgical hip dislocation where you actually open, see the femoral head, and then um, uh, replace the cartilage with either with autograft uh, from a donor site, um, such as what we do with the knee and the uh, ankle, where we do something called mosaic plastic, taking a cartilage plug from another location that is not as weight bearing and place it into the hole. Alternatively, if the defect is very large, you can take a uh, cadaveric uh, fresh frozen um, uh, graft that has a similar sphericity and uh, can use that uh, for the defect. Uh, microfracture uh, does work, uh, but it really works in the um, lesions that are relatively small. Um, so in this study, um, these are not tremendously large and they, the patient did not have significant amounts of arthritis. Five year follow up with 42 hips, 72% uh, survivorship. Uh, but even still, if you look at this, 12 of those 42 did ultimately within five years go on to hip replacement. And Others needed multiple, you know, needed revision arthroscopy. Um, but if you did not go on to have uh, the surgery, they did have improved uh, hip scores. Uh, now we're going to talk a little bit about uh, labral damage associated with uh, hip dysplasia. Um, and the outcomes are not as good as those with patients who don't have uh, uh, hip dysplasia. So the longer your hip has had abnormal forces, the worse your outcomes tend to be. So if you're in your 40s and above, um, it's not as good. Um, as your head coverage is reduced, you have more and more forces on it. So um, this was that uh, tonus angle we had earlier. Uh, so the larger this angle becomes, uh, the worse, uh, the, the, the more oblique uh, the socket is and the more forces are placed on the cartilage. And the CEA, as we talked about, which is how much the, oops, how much the head uh, covers uh, is covered by the acetabulum. The less coverage, the worse the uh, results. If your cartilage space here is reduced and you start getting um, two millimeters or under two millimeters of space, you do not do as well. And if you have a break in Shenton's line, which implies that the femoral head is migrating uh, laterally and superiorly, those do not do as well. So the, the principle is as follows, is that there is a finite amount of, of pressure that cartilage can take. And as one subluxates the femoral head in a lateral direction, uh, the pressure is increased and the cartilage begins to yield. Uh, this will also tear the labrum. When you lose the seal, as we talked about, you lose lubrication as well as the nutrition. We have increased pressure and we get sclerosis, the lateral acetabulum. The result is um, destruction of the joint. So uh, here we have the normal situation of the acetabulum here and the femoral head well covered, but with dysplasia, it moves superiorly and laterally. And all the pressure of weight bearing is now going to be seen in this small contact point. And if that is the case, you will have arthritis and pain uh, and um, uh, this hip is doomed to uh, receive a hip replacement if it is not addressed. There is also something called a rim syndrome, which is sometimes it's not the labrum that rips, but actually a, um, an area of bone that yields. And that needs sometimes to be addressed at the time of uh, surgery. Uh, here is actually a, a pediatric patient of mine from many years ago uh, who had a significant rim fracture uh, 
uh, and that was uh, treated with uh, actually a combination of uh, open reduction control fixation, and then I did a pelvic osteotomy where I reoriented the acetabulum to contain the hip better. Uh, this person also has a break in Shen's line. I'll show you Shen's line here. Oops. And hold on a second. So um, if you follow the femoral neck across to the obturator foramen, it makes a smooth path. But over here, if you look, the obturator foramen is here and the femoral neck is here. And you can see that it doesn't quite line up because the femoral head has moved laterally. Um, certainly you need to look at their tonus score and this is not the angle. This is actually looking at arthritis and do they have um, the formation of dense bone? Is the joint narrowing? Is there cysts? Is the narrowing in a small regional area or is it extensive? Uh, and arthroscopic techniques work best in tone is zero and one, but once you start to narrow, long-term results are not good and they will ultimately fail. You may give them some relief for a short period of time, but over time they will have problems. This was looking at uh, something that Dr. Patterson alluded to, which was the crossover sign, and that has to do with the version, the rotation of the um, acetabulum. And this, in this case, it is a crossover sign where there is retroverted. Uh, when the socket is not in the appropriate position, you can have a pincer uh, abnormality, which is where the, where the edge of the bone is hitting on the femoral neck and causing destruction. And that too is often better treated with a osteotomy and rotating the pelvis than it is uh, treating it with an arthroscopic uh, technique. So when one has dysplasia, there is a place for arthroscopy, um, but if it is uh, significantly involved, uh, then one would need to address it uh, with um, a repositional technique where you actually bend, uh, you cut the pelvis and place the acetabulum in a more advantageous um, location. So in other words, you are going from this dysplastic position back uh, to the better position of full coverage of the acetabulum and the femoral head. The best technique for that is something called a periastabular osteotomy, and the one that is most popularly selected uh, was described, described by a gentleman named Reinhold Gans uh, in Bern, Switzerland, uh, and that allows um, reposition of the acetabulum, um, so you're basically uh, cutting um, the acetabulum free and then rotating into your desirable uh, position. Okay, so now we'll talk a little bit about femoral acetabular impingement. Um, as was uh, said so openly earlier, it is a significant cause of osteoarthritis and between uh, femoral acetabular impingement and hip dysplasia, uh, perhaps 90% of atraumatic uh, hip arthritis is, uh, is a result of those two conditions. Um, it leads to uh, damage at the labrum and damage at the uh, chondral surfaces. Um, here we have the cam type where the femoral head is out of round and as it presses in, it will uh, cause delamination here at the, at the edge, but it will also cause a uh, abnormality and um, irregularity of the acetabular cartilage uh, posteriorly. This is the pincer type where the bone itself is actually going to dig into the uh, femoral head and will cause uh, labral tear and injury to the femoral head. Uh, this is one of my pre-op uh, CAT scans and on the CAT scan um, one can certainly see this significant pr uh, prominence and you can map out how much you need to resect. Uh, for me, um, as was actually said earlier, uh, CAT scans are really a preoperative uh, test when I'm trying to figure out uh, how much bone I need to resect. Uh, there is a limit to how much you can resect, uh, and if you go too far, and so you, you cut more than a third of the femoral neck diameter, uh, there is a high risk of femoral neck fracture. Uh, so it's really a modest um, resection, uh, usually only five, seven millimeters in depth uh, in order to um, now improve and restore the sphericity of the femoral neck. Uh, here is a, another patient pre-op uh, MRI, and this is, he had bilateral disease, 
So both hips originally looked exactly the same. Um, this was the second hip, this is the first hip, and I've already, I had recontoured that under, um, during arthroscopy. Uh, I use x-ray uh, as well as dynamically flexing, extending the hip and see where the impingement is. Um, one can easily see on the other side that before it had surgery, this prominence um, to get to the more natural part of his hip was about here. So everything between here and here in order to restore the, the sphericity of the head needs to be shaved. And this amount is really somewhere around um, six, seven millimeters uh, in uh, resection, in depth. Uh, because there are not a lot of long, long-term studies uh, with the success of resection of femoral acetabular impingement, um, uh, a consensus uh, study came out uh, just this past year, um, and uh, these are the recommendations. And it's a lot of what I, what I alluded to. You know, you first you give them the physical therapy, but you see, um, you know, how big is the cam. Um, do they have a low tonus score? In other words, are they not very arthritic? And if such, um, they're good candidates, uh, then you would um, uh, consider doing the resection and addressing the labrum at that time. Uh, the results have certainly been uh, favorable in, favorable in uh, selected uh, patients. Um, uh, in this uh, study of uh, 327 hips, um, these were all patients under 50 um, provided they did not have arthritis or a slip capillary epiphysis or AVN or hip dysplasia. In other words, other than their cam lesion in the labral tear, they had no other abnormalities. Um, they did very well. Uh, only um, uh, 25 hips here actually went in this um, five-year follow-up on to hip replacement. Um, not surprisingly, um, numbness was their most common uh, complication, uh, followed by heterotopic ossification, which is still low numbers, and a very low uh, incidence of infection. As I said earlier, uh, increased uh, size, um, uh, female slightly higher, uh, lower preoperative hip scores, in other words, they had more pain to start with, large alpha angles, so larger cam lesions, um, and those who require the capsule release and uh, labeled agreement. In other words, they could not have, they were not having repair or having cleaning up of their labrum did not do as well. Next, I'm going to talk about uh, snapping hip, and this is um, circumduction, um, looking actively for the snapping of the iliopsoas over the pectineal eminence, which is the pelvic brim. So um, uh, typically, I'll actually have the patient do this motion of circumduction, and I will palpate the iliopsoas. I will feel the click, and I will ask them, is it painful directly under uh, my hand? And the hand will be located. Um, just to the medial side of the ASIS. For the um, uh, IT band, you certainly can in thin patients, as I was mentioned, can see it actually clicking. Um, I can feel with circumduction, but I can also feel it uh, with them lying in the lateral decubitus position as they flex and extend. You can hear it chunk chunk, uh, that, that feeling, palpable feeling as the IT band goes and hurts them. Um, both conditions are actually should initially be treated with physical therapy, and I will tell you that the vast majority of my patients will do very well with therapy alone and anti-inflammatories. In those who are not doing better, uh, I will do an injection in the office of the IT band with marcaine and steroid, uh, and for the iliopsoas, I would have that injected uh, in the imaging suite uh, under image guidance, which will either be ultrasound or uh, x-ray. Um, that too can be very effective, uh, often addresses their, their, their condition and um, can resolve it. Um, but if it does not resolve it, it will at least uh, allow me to address that this, confirm that this is what their problem is. It is not in the joint itself, or at least this is a portion of their problem. And then I can treat it surgically if necessary. So, <coughs> excuse me, once again, this is the iliopsoas, which as one flex and extends and internally externally rotates, rubs over this area, over the pelvic brim. In patients with a fair amount of femoral acetabular dysplasia, um, in other words, they're very retroverted, it can cause irritation and injury to the labrum. It can also be a cause of instability if one um, cuts it in a very um, dysplastic patient. So the, the arthroscopic treatment for this person 
um, is a lengthening of the uh, iliopsoas. Uh, that can be done, and the way I typically do it is um, make a small window in the uh, anterior capsule, and then I'm looking at the iliopsoas as it passes over the joint capsule, and then divide it. Uh, the femoral nerve is close, so uh, care is uh, required. Um, the results are really very satisfying, uh, but there is still a 9% recurrence rate, uh, but there's 90% relief of pain. Um, I have not had any problems with long-term uh, weakness of the hip flexor, but I do tell the patients that for the first few weeks, they're gonna have it, find it very hard uh, to go up the stairs. And in fact, they should avoid it if they uh, can. Similarly, uh, the IT band, which is right here, um, causes pain and uh, irritation. They usually have a tight over test. In other words, the IT band is too tight. Um, some people have a friction syndrome by their knee, uh, but uh, I usually see them for the snapping at the hip. Traditionally, this was done open. Uh, the iliopsoas also was done open, but the results are better for both with lower morbidity. Uh, through the arthroscope, um, uh, using two portals, you can um, uh, resect a window directly over the um, a greater trochanter, and that uh, very successfully addresses uh, this uh, condition. In uh, this last vein, I will talk a little bit about gluteus medius repair. Um, as one can have rotator cuff problems, you can also have the similar cuff issue of sorts of the hip. Uh, that would be an injury to the gluteus medius. Um, this is a relatively newer technique. Uh, this can be done open and this can be done arthroscopically, arthroscopic being the newer of the uh, techniques. Uh, it certainly works, uh, but the rehab is slower. Um, you need to protect them against uh, abduction. Uh, and in this case, um, I use a brace uh, where I don't typically use a brace for my other hip arthroscopy patients. Um, the results are certainly better, but they're not large studies. You know, this is a study, one of the bigger ones with only 20 hips. Um, their Harris hip scores uh, improved. They're not normal, but they are better. Uh, one of the advantages, of course, of the hip arthroscopy is that you can dress um, other pathology at the same time as you um, address the, uh, the trochanter. Um, we're, we're getting close to two o'clock, so I'll, I will wrap this up. Um, physical therapy um, for the IT band iliopsoas actually goes pretty quickly. Um, since the vast majority of the patients I take care of for this are teenagers, uh, often dancers um, uh, and gymnasts. Um, uh, range of motion in the first two weeks, um, often by two weeks they will get off of the crutches, progressive weight bearing, uh, and sometime um, usually before five to six months, they're actually ready to return to sport. Uh, the gluteus repairs, however, are much, much slower uh, in returning to function. Um, and I do not let them get off the crutches for six to eight weeks, close to eight. Uh, and active abduction happens really sometime after the two month mark. And my second to last slide, which I thought was interesting, was that uh, uh, a large uh, study was looked at, was looking at patients who've had uh, um, hip arthroscopy versus uh, the general population versus other orthopedic abnormalities. And uh, for ACL patients, um, there was a slightly 1.56 times higher incidence of um, having a uh, psychiatric CPT diagnosis. Interestingly enough, for the hip patients, it was three times uh, the general population. Um, I did not see a similar study for the back, uh, but I bet you it would be very similar. In any event, uh, thank you for your time and attention. Uh, I open up to any questions. much Dr. Wallach and to Dr. Patterson and Dr. Nazemi today. Thank you for giving your time and doing these great presentations. I want to give the opportunity for anybody to ask questions. You may type them in the chat box and I can read them out loud. I'll give you guys a few minutes and just go through the uh, end here today. Just a reminder for physical therapists and for athletic trainers, for proof of attendance for physical therapists, please email Patricia Lamb.
for proof of attendance for athletic trainers, please email Christos Scaglias. For physicians, nurses, uh, PAs, you can go through the CME office and get that certificate of completion. Each attendee of this webinar will receive uh, an email from the Renaissance School of Medicine. Please complete this if you can so we can help improve our future webinars. If you have any questions, feel free to contact me directly. A reminder that we do have these webinars up on the Stony Brook Medicine YouTube channel. The first two, the foot and ankle and the knee are available for viewing. This hip one should be uploaded mid next week, so feel free to share them. You cannot get the educational credit for these, but you can use them and uh, glance at them at your convenience. Reminder that Stony Brook Orthopedics does have an orthopedic urgent care. It's at our East Atawket office from Monday through Friday, 3 to 6.30 p.m. A reminder also about our, our multiple locations that we have in East Setauket, Comac, Hampton Bays, Patchogue, and Stony Brook. If you have any questions, feel free to contact our main scheduling line, 444-4233, to schedule with any one of our physicians. I want to thank everybody for attending this webinar today. Uh, we do appreciate the change with our in-person webinar, or our in-person conference, I should say, for our sports medicine update to a series of webinars. We do have another webinar in the works. We're looking for November for this. We're just trying to get all the balls moving. Uh, and then we will definitely uh, post this on the Stony Brook website. You can check the LinkedIn page, the Facebook, and the Twitter pages. So keep your eye out for updates on future sports medicine webinars. This seems like uh, we'll be doing this just for a bit so we can offer some educational opportunities to the community and to our, our physicians and our healthcare professionals. If anybody has any other questions, feel free to ask. Nice and quiet. All right, thank you again to our presenters. It looks like a few people are looking to uh, get off here. <laughs> we do appreciate you taking out the time today. We will see you on future webinars. And uh, if you need to share this with anybody, like I said, it will be up on the Stony Brook Medicine YouTube channel mid next week. Have a great day, everybody.